hello everyone. My name is Cameron Bailey. I'm the artistic director and co-head of TIFF. And welcome to our masterclass with George C. Wolf. As you join us today, we want to encourage you to reflect on the land that you're on. Uh, who are its traditional keepers? What is the treaty relationship? Or is it unceded territory? Here in Toronto, we're located on the treaty lands and territory of the Mississaugas of the Credit and the traditional territory of the Anishinaabe, the Wendat, and the Haudenosaunee. This territory is within the lands protected by the Dish with One Spoon Wampum Belt Covenant and is home to many First Nations, Inuit, and Métis people. And we're grateful to work on this land. Today, as we stream via TIFF Industries Facebook, YouTube, and Twitter, we're thrilled to have filmmaker George C. Wolf and host Wayne Mingesha join us for tonight's masterclass. I'd like to thank our lead sponsor, Bell, our major sponsors, RBC, L'Oreal Paris, and Visa, as well as our major public supporters, the Government of Canada, the Government of Ontario, and the City of Toronto. TIFF's industry programming is generously supported by Ontario Creates and Telefilm Canada, and tonight's industry masterclass is presented in partnership with Netflix. Our guest this evening is George C. Wolfe. He's one of North America's most influential cultural voices in theater and film. And with five Tony Awards, he's established himself as an actor's director. We've seen his work at the Public Theater in New York, which is where I first encountered uh, George's work years ago, on Broadway and more recently on screen. His most recent film is Ma Rainey's Black Bottom, which stars Viola Davis and Chadwick Boseman in brilliant performances. And to lead today's conversation with George, we're very lucky and thrilled to have Wayne Mangesha. She's the artistic director of Toronto's Soul Pepper Theatre and has directed the plays To Kink in My Hair and the original stage play of Kim's Convenience years ago. And she continues to be a real trailblazer in contemporary theatre. Wayne, over to you. Thank you, Cameron, and welcome all of you. Thank you for being with us today. I am thrilled to have this conversation. Um, as Cameron said, you know, George C. Wolf has made a huge impact on culture and a, on me personally as a director, where many of the productions you have been involved in have been pivotal in my career. So Thank I want to, yeah, absolutely. I, I want to start from the beginning. I, I want to know, um, how did you get to storytelling? What, what started you and, and does the same thing drive you today? Well, so I mean, storytelling as a just period from the very beginning or? Well, you know, you wear so many hats as writer, director. And so just to let, yeah, I'm wondering what the first spark was for you. Um, well, I don't know. I was, I'm from Frankfort, Kentucky, and I was always obsessed with, initially with theater and storytelling. And, you know, in Frankfort, Kentucky, is not like a cultural center. You know what I mean? It wasn't like you could go out and see a concert and this and this and this. It's a small town. I mean, it's the, it's the capital of the state. So it it had a and, and, and also there is a there was a, a, a black university there. So it had it it, it, it it had a very specific, very focused, very driven black community inside of this small town that was the capital. And I grew up in the black community very much so there. And I went to this uh private laboratory school that was part of the university. And my mother taught there and she was a principal there. And um, so I, you know, so, and, and, and my town was segregated for about the first six years of my life. So I lived inside a very ice insulated world so that this community was very invested in protecting me, not just me, but that was the, that was the uh, sort of ambition of the community to protect, you know, those who were young from any harshness that they might encounter. So I grew up in, I would say, in somewhat of a bubble. In, in, and so, so that therefore, and because of that bubble, I lived inside of my creativity. And, um, you know, I was obsessed with, with, you know, Walt Disney movies. I, I was obsessed, and people tell me that, that you know, people tell me that when I, when, when I would get together with my cousins and we would play house, I would give them lines to say. Mm -hmm. so, so I would so I one I was a control freak, but also two I was making stories, and then um, and then I I I came to New York with my mother. She was getting some advanced degree work at NYU, and I saw two broad I played two or three Broadway shows. I saw a mobile unit uh, production of Hamlet that was from the Public Theater New York Shakespeare Festival, which X number of years later I ended up is mm -hmm. where my play Color Museum started, and I end up running. 
Mm-hmm. So, so, so that so that so that trip when I was twelve, in essence, was was indirectly, in some strange odd way, showing me my future mm-hmm. uh, of, of what it would be like in New York. And um, and then um, and then I went away to college. And when I first went to college, I was a I was an acting and design major. And then I focused to acting and directing. And then my last year there, I wrote a play. And um, and then I was in LA and I was, um, you know, and I was doing plays and I was working at a place called the Inner City Cultural Center, which they became the Los Angeles Cultural Center. And I was doing work and I started to get good reviews in the New York Times. I'm very young, 21, 22, something like that. And, and at one point I was invited into a meeting about potentially a sitcom and I remember very specifically someone said, oh, he's quick. We're going to have to tie one hand behind his back. And I went, it's time to leave L.A. Uh-huh. <laughs> Instant because, I, you know, I instinctively knew, no, 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 no. So then I, I, I moved to New York um, and, you know, and I went there and I said, I'm a writer and director. They said, no, you can't do that. I said, what do you, no, you can be a writer or a director. A director should not direct his own material. I said, okay. And I was going to NYU and I was getting my master's. And uh, I wrote this, and I was in, I had a double MFA in dramatic writing and musical theater. And uh, the scandals and the stories about that will be in the book one day. And, um, and then I wrote this show that was designed for success. And it was a musical and it got vilely trashed by the critics. And then I wrote this other thing that I was writing for me and that turned into this play called The Colored Museum, which then launched my career and um, and ended up being very successful. And as I, like I said, started at a theater in New Jersey, Crossroads, and ended up at the public theater, then toured around, went, went to London at the Royal Court, all those sorts of places like that. And, and again, I, and then, I, I had a series, and then because, you know, I got a rave review in the New York Times, I met with all of these uh, studio heads, but as a writer. And once again, my instinct said, that's not how you, you know, and there were a number of projects that I almost did or kind of did, um, but it something didn't feel right. And then, um, and then, and then eventually, you know, then I started, you know, I did shows on Broadway, you know, I, and I took over the public theater and. I've done 17 Broadway shows. And uh, I remember at one point I was directing a, um, a, a, a show at the public and it had a lot of projections and, and a lot of imagery and a lot of film work. And uh, most Steph, who's a, who become a friend of mine at the time, Yassine Bey said, go direct that movie. <laughs> you, you, just go ahead because you're doing this play with so much, with so many visuals, just go direct the movie. You know, and I ended up directing Lackawanna Blues, which is a show that I had produced at the public theater with my friend Ruben Santiago Hudson, and I directed it. And that, and that's sort of that's sort of the journey, you know. Mm-hmm. And along the way, I, you know, I helped to create a civil and human rights museum in Atlanta. Mm-hmm. And so, anytime, anytime I find myself inside of something that either intrigues me or scares me, or 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 activates some, um, I want to know more energy inside of me than I become involved with. Mm. So that's sort of your meter, your inner compass as far as picking a project. Well, it's like, it's, it, it changes. It's like uh, when, you know, when, when I was offered Angels in America to direct on Broadway, it's like, you, you know, there's a couple of things. I think Broadway, it was the 100th anniversary of Broadway. And I think that in its entire history, no, no director of color, and this may not be true, so all you historians don't come screaming, but I, 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 I was told, or I believe that at the time, no director of color had directed a major white play mm-hmm. on Broadway at the time. And so, so that was, I felt that, that sense of responsibility, plus the fact that it was a brilliant work, but also I went like, this is seven hours of theater. How the hell do you do that? And so that activated, you know, and so it was, it was in many respects, aside from the fact that it was, it's a masterpiece and aside from the fact that I was breaking some kind of boundary, it was like, how the hell do you do seven hours 
of theater. And then I just went, oh, like everything else, one scene at a time. So, mm. and, and that took me on a journey there. Uh, and then there were other times where it's very interesting with, with Lackawanna Blues, um, you know, they, they were in the process of developing the material at HBO and Ruben, uh, and they, they called me up and Ruben called me up and said, would you get involved? And I said, well, let me just help out. And so a lot of times when I'm considering working on something, I'll pretend I'm not working on it. I'll just go, well, let me just help out and see what happens. And then so then I can trick myself into becoming obsessed with it. Is that because you want to make sure it's the right fit, it's the right energy, it's the right? I don't know. I think maybe it's just, um, no, I think um, I, I'm, 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 I'm cautious about committing. Mm. Mm -hmm. I'm cautious about committing because when I commit, I do it with such ferocity. And so it's, even though part of my brain has already decided that I'm going to commit, but I'm doing a little dance, a game with myself to avoid, you know, jumping off the cliff. Cause I know once I jump off the cliff, I jump totally off the cliff. Well, and, yeah. I, and I completely surrender myself to the material that I'm working on. I mean, that makes sense. I mean, that's the thing, uh, you know, that really inspires me about your career is nobody can pigeonhole you. You've done every, you know, so many genres, so many mediums. And so it's it's interesting to hear what is that common denominator that doesn't have to do with even a social threat. It has to do with you growing in a way. Yeah, absolutely. Because it's like my thing is I, you know, I generally want to do the exact opposite of something that I've just done. So at the Colored Museum, I instantly did Spunk. Zora mm -hmm. Hurston's material, because it's completely the opposite, because I know I'm going to come out with muscles that I didn't have before. Mm -hmm. And, you know, and I and, 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 and you I think you have to keep growing. And part of the, the way you grow is by you by by confronting the unknown and risking failure. I mean, you know, I have this firm belief that an audience can tell a, a theater audience, a a, uh, a film audience and audience passing through a museum, they can tell when they are in the presence of a truth that was discovered just for them. And they can tell when they are in the presence of something that has been recycled from mm -hmm. another truth that you learned on another project. So mm -hmm. the way to protect yourself from becoming stale to your own self and to your own creative process is to keep on, is to, is to keep on going on, you know, Danger, dangerous, scary, fun adventures that take you into another world that you've never lived inside of or haven't lived inside of quite the same way. Mm, I, that, I, that resonates because, yeah, when you're that present, well, well, fear keeps you present, doesn't it? Right. And it's alive. Well, it's like you it, it's 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 the power of the unknown. Mm -hmm. it, and it's the power, it, the power of the unknown. And it's the power of not knowing, which are two completely different things. And I love the period on a project where I can surrender and not know, where, where I, I just sort of let myself not know and then sort of go on the journey of figuring it out and then, and, and still not knowing, and then an image will come to you. I mean, I was, you know, we were working on, um, I was working with Ruben on, on, on the script for Ma Rainey. And then uh, he, he was coming down because we were going to go through, I was going to give him some notes or something like that. And when he opened up the door, I said, I figured out how it ended. And just that day, it had popped into my head about having the white band at the end of Ma Rainey appear. Mm -hmm. I didn't know that. I didn't know that when I started talking to him about the script. I didn't know that at all. But I mean, but I, I was just letting myself figure it out and figure it out. I didn't. There it was, and 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 it came from the not knowing. And speaking about uh, Ruben and your relationship with him, this is the second time you've you've adapted something together from play to screen. Um, and there's been a bit of a you know there's been some time passed. Did it did, did was there a different rhythm this time working together? Well, was no, I, it was. I think it was a little bit different because. Ruben has directed August Wilson plays. Ruben has mm -hmm. been in August Wilson plays. He's had a Tony for an August Wilson play. He did a one man show, you know, based on August's writing. And so he is, um, he is, he is a member of that family. And I, I, I've, I've never done any of August's work at all. 
you know. Mm -hmm. uh, at one point, he talked to me. I, I bumped into him in bumped into him in the bathroom at the Goodman Theater in Chicago, and he told me, "I have a play for you." And I said, "Well, can I read it?" And he said, "I haven't written it yet." And I said, "Well, how do I know if I have anything to, to of value to offer it until I until I've read it?" And so I ended up. So I never have direct. I never directed an August Wilson play. Period. Which is a, such a you know for to think about George C. Wolf and August never working together. It's it's kind of amazing. It's two greats in the theater, and and so and you know. People always talk about Wilson. There's a kind of rhythm to his work. There's a kind of language. You have to get everybody in the same world. How was it working on a, on on his on his text? Well, it was it was it was fun. I mean, it's uh, I I don't you know I don't know those I don't know the rules. I don't know those rules, and mm -hmm. I don't and I don't I I just I just know how to dig in. I just know how to dig in and and and. And, and go excavating and trying to find truths and the story that's underneath the story or the truth that's underneath the truth that's underneath the truth so that therefore it's activated in, um, I mean, a, a number of interviewers talk, you know, speak to me about, you know, the reverence of, 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 of August. And I say, I'm, I'm, I'm not a reverent human being. I'm not, I'm a respectful human being, but I'm not, I don't, I don't believe, I don't believe art comes from reverence, at least not for me. Mm -hmm. And so I have to feel free. I need to feel free to discover and to not know. And 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 and, and reverence implies to me a series of givens. And I think when you start start to work on a project, there are no givens. There's and that's what's thrilling about it. It's you know, it's like what what do you find curious about it? What do you find fascinating about it? What what resonates within you that that you feel as though you can give to this material? And I was, you know, and then did you and then there are certain things that intrigue me that that when Ma Ma Rainey says uh, to uh, Irving, you know, where she says, I can take my 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 black ass back down south because I don't like it up here anyway, I would go, okay, that's really fascinating to me because <laughs> you had you have a hundred thousand black people who moved into Chicago alone in the first 20 years of the last century. And then you have Ma Rainey who's going, I'm going in the exact opposite direction. Well, why? And then you dig into our history and you see that she was a property owner and she was an entrepreneur and she was in charge of her career. And she owned two theaters in, in Columbus, Georgia. And, and she hired people and she was, she was an out lesbian and she was tough and nobody messed with her. And so she's coming in from a power base. And so, and also in the South, given the segregated structure, um, if, if she was able to create her own order inside of that rigidity, whereas versus when you go North, you're gonna have to deal with white power structures. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Period, oh. mm -hmm. period, period, period. You have, you know, you have the Cotton Club in Harlem that interestingly enough was a club that was owned by Jack Jackson, the boxer. And then the white mob took it over and created the Cotton Club. And, and uh, it was for white patrons. No black people were allowed in the front door, but they were on stage entertaining. And at the same time, Duke Ellington, when Duke Ellington was performing there, he did, there were radio recordings and he, had, and, and he created some extraordinary music, but that dichotomy was at play. That was coming into contact with a white power structure, i.e. the mob white power structure, mm -hmm. whereas mob is used to doing it herself. So I felt as though, once again, so I went like, oh, well, that gives me a clue. We need to see, we need to see that. So that when she shows up and she's in the face of a white policeman or she's in the face of Sturdivant and Irvin, She's not a black girl going off. She's she is a, a, a black person with power mm -hmm. saying you must acknowledge my power. Mm -hmm. She's not she doesn't, it's not her hand on her hip and going blah, blah, blah. No, she's going. This is how this is going to go down, period. And mm -hmm. she can do that because she has her own power. Mm -hmm. because she has her own self own significance. So just in that exploration, you know, the whole opening sequence of the film was crafted mm. just from the, the exploration of that one line. So digging into that one August Wilson line that he wrote for her to say, 
it got my brain going, oh, what about this? What about this? What about this? And so that whole tent show sequence and, and seeing that and seeing the images of the Great Migration and seeing all of the dynamics at play came from that one line. So that didn't come from, that came from digging into the line and then thinking about the history of the moments and the storytelling and the power of who she was. So, and also because in the structure of the play, she doesn't appear until at least 40 or 50 minutes into the play. And it's called My Randy's Black Bottom. And we don't want, I didn't want my film artists to sitting there going, when's she gonna show up? When's she gonna show up? Because mm-hmm. they're, they're waiting on, because they're, they're, they're waiting on Viola's face to appear, mm-hmm. as opposed to listening to what's going on. Mm-hmm. So. Well, no, I mean, that was so, um, thank goodness for the irreverence because just in what you told us in those first five seconds with the trees and the people running and then you switching our expectations to not that they're running from something but towards the tent absolutely absolutely well, so well, that's the metaphor that's the that's the metaphor of of, of of black culture yeah there's the horror over there but there's you know it's what the blues is you know my man done left me but you know i'm feeling so weary but <laughs> yeah i'm yeah, acknowledging i'm acknowledging the loss but my spirit, my heart, my ferocity of my brain, my being has not given up. Mm-hmm. And I'm looking for that which is next. And the images that, you know, the fact that the simplicity of those images that look like documentary images and then they turn and look at you. you just said, wait, we are not talking about history. You know, I know this play, but you're here right now with me. Very, oh my goodness, good, my goodness. Could you, please, 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 I want to talk to you forever about this movie because it's like, that's exactly what it was. Because they were trying to say, so can't you use the photographs? I said, one, there's such a finite number of, of images from the Great Migration. But also, I don't want to, tra- I'm not trafficking in nostalgia. Mm-hmm. I'm trafficking in, in the moment. Yeah. I'm trafficking in the moment. This, these, this, these, these, these are decisions that are being made now. They're, they're making a decision to go north at the same time Ma has made a decision to go to Chicago to, do, to record these, these, th- these songs. So it's all happening in the moment. There is no nostalgia. I hate nostalgia. Nostalgia is a, is a, is a sedative for, for, for fearful brains. So, um, you know, so it was all about living completely and totally in the uncertainty of the next moment. Yeah, I found it such a brilliant way to, to to just comment on the fact that this 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 all affects where we are t- today. One hundred percent, absolutely. And, and of us together, so yeah, and, and so talk to me about and also, and also one of the things that was very interesting is, um, I I wanted to play around with the, with the all the visual tropes that exist in movies about the South mm-hmm. that you know it's woods. And oh, it's cicadas in the trees. Oh, and are we going to hear Billie Holiday sing strange fruit? No. What we're seeing, oh, are two people running. Oh, we hear dogs barking. Oh, oh, fear, horror, horror. No, possibility. Possibility. Black people paying for their own black music. That's exactly. That was one of the most important images that I wanted to see. Black black hands putting coins in black hands. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. That was a you, you know. Powerful, yeah, and also it being set in the summer versus in the play where it's in the winter. Well, because the, the north is like you know in the in urban centers, it's you know heat is horrifying. You know, in the south, the earth absorbs the heat. In an urban situation, that heat hits that concrete, bounces off of that concrete, and into your body. Hmm and into your body. It's also, I made a very decision. I didn't want it to see, there's one scene where she's in front of the colored hotel where we see hydrangeas, but I made a decision with, 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 uh, with, with the production designer and also with visual effect. I want every single tree to be removed from Chicago. I don't want to see any nature. I don't want to see any nature anywhere in Chicago just to make it seem like an, such an alien environment for what my and Havana used to. There is no nature. Mm-hmm. There's only steel and buildings and people staring or are desperate or celebrating how glorious their new life is. Hmm. I wanted to ask you about that process. Just, you know, when you're wearing the hat of a stage director and theater director, I've heard you in a, you know, say that in theater, you, it starts with an image for you. Is it the same entry point making a film as it is with theater for you? Well, I don't know. Uh, I don't think, I don't really think about it. I don't really think about the, 
once again, going back to your first question, I think it's it's a, to me it's just about the storytelling and and um, and like in the script, we I ended up cutting probably about thirty to forty a, a minutes worth of material that was in the play for the film, and because I really wanted to telescope on the power dynamic between Levy and Ma, hmm. and and. And, and and I and that everything else that is revealed is revealed because of that dynamic, mm -hmm. and and because and I and I also wanted to really intensify the fact that save for the prologue, which is in the south, and then the epilogue, which is the white van, this is one day. So I really wanted the characters and in turn the audience to be caught up in the intensity of the time frame. Ma Rainey, the, the film is set in 1927. Ma Rainey never recorded again after 1928. And we see what happens to Levy and we see what happens to other characters. So this day is monumental. This day is monumental. And I wanted to create this, this casual sense because you, you, you're figuring out as you're going on this casual sense of the intensity of just one day. And as the hotter the day be becomes, the, the more intense the, uh, you know, the, the, the emotions and the feelings. I remember very early on at one point, just I was having a casual conversation with Denzel and he mentioned something about, and he was just talking about, yeah, I've come out to switching it from the to, you know, to the South. And then he talked about the sun. He just, he, he he made a couple of references to the sun and I just, my brain just went click. And then I just went, oh, oh, oh. And then I made a decision that I wanted, the sun was this white ball in a white sky. So that once again, any sense of familiarity, that blue sky, that's gone. There's no, there's nothing reassuring about it. So, so, so you dig inside of the thought and then the thought leads to a question. The question leads to, not knowing and then the not knowing leads to the answers. Mm. Beautiful. I want to make sure we cover also, you know, you're often referred to as an actor's director and you, you guided two astonishing performances. Do you had, did, was it the same? They're just two mammoth roles, two monster roles. I'm wondering if you had the same approach as a director, do you approach, do you sort of figure out how an actor best responds or do you have a similar approach? I'm just curious, how do you, how do you approach actors? No, you have to, you, you approach every, I mean, I think there are two schools of directing. I, I think there are, you, there are two, the, one school is you stand where you are, you demand everybody comes to you. And then the other school is you go to where they are and then you challenge, charm, seduce, question, and get them to end up in the, in the place where you, where you would, you think they and the character should be. I mean, when I, I when I did the production of Iceman Cometh with Denzel on Broadway as a cast of 19 people, and it was a cast where everybody was so idiosyncratically different that I, 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 evolved, I had to evolve a very specific language to talk to every single, completely different language to talk to every single person who was in that production. And, and, and you, you, you figure out it was really wonderful because on this film, because, uh, you know, uh, you know, one with, 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 with Denzel as a producer and Denzel being also from the theater, you know, I, I wanted I wanted two weeks of rehearsal, you know, because a lot of time when you do film, people go like, what? No, horrifying. Oh, and sometimes those are actors doing that. And uh, so I we, 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 we set aside two weeks of, uh, of, uh, of, of, of rehearsal period in which, you know, we would read the material, we'd talk, we ask questions. I, I crudely staged some of the scenes in the band room with the four guys. Um, and it's just all about building, learn, and, and one of the things, and then when they weren't rehearsing, they were learning how to, you know, play their instruments. So, but one of the main things that was, that, that was happening while we were discussing material is I was evolving a language of how to communicate with them. Hmm. You know, so that therefore you, you're figuring out how they talk and how they think. And so you're, you're kind of evolving a way to communicate with them so that therefore when you're when you start filming, you're not you're not searching for it. You have found a language of collaboration. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So it's very different. It's, it's 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 very, very different. You just you know, you have to. 
if you really watch, actors give you signals all the time. They give you signals about what they understand, what they don't understand, what they're confused by. And then you can, sometimes you can see um, in a series of, of, of maybe somewhat muted choices, a, a, an impulse that is really, 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 really smart. And so you have to really completely focus, be totally focused because then you can say or do something that will nurture or, or, or encourage them to access that impulse, which is hidden inside of themselves and use that and push that to the foreground. So it's about being um, uh, totally available and totally um, fragile to their fragility in some, while at the same time, you know, being in charge of driving this whole machine. So, so it's, you know, it's, it's, it perpetually cultivating, you know, energies and thought process that at times seem diametrically opposite, but they are. Mm. So driving things the way they need to be driven, but at the same time being totally available and present in the room so that you can see an impulse. I remember I was in college and I was directing a project, something that I had written, and the cast was over in the corner making noise and there was something wasn't working with the composer. And I was talking to the composer and, uh, you know, and it wasn't quite working. I was, and we were talking and the cast was over there making noise and they were just making noise and he was driving, come on, come on guys, come on guys. And I was talking, trying to solve the problem. I was talking to this guy, trying to get him to get the impulse of what was going on. And they kept on making noise. And just at the point where I started to get impatient, they were all sitting around the piano and they had solved the moment. Mm -hmm. So that if you have smart people in the room, this the solution can come from anybody. So there's no, uh, there's no, uh, you know, vanity is vanity is unnecessary to the creative process. Mm -hmm. You need real trust, real faith. Yeah. Well, it's also and 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 and, a, and confidence, and you know, it and and confidence that. I will solve it at confidence. I will figure it out, Conf you know, and and not because if you strike out at a, in a collaboration is generally because of your own insecurity. Hmm. You know, if you become painfully impatient, it generally has something to do with you and not to do with nothing to do with the person you're working with. Yeah, I hear you on that. Yeah. Well, yeah, you, I mean, like you said, you know, you, you had that moment when you realized how, how it ended and you needed, yeah. you needed for it to wait, right? People say yeah. genius is a thing that appears. It's not something that you live, you just imbued. Well, if you know it already, it's not, <laughs> you know. You know, um, Tanya Pinkins is a wonderful actor that I've worked with a bunch of times. I, talk, I say a lot of stuff and I forget what I say once I've said it, but she said that I said, which is, she said that I said, brilliance exists in an idea that might not work. Yeah. You know, and, 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 and hearing and hearing. I remember when the band was when the band was on set um, and it was very interesting. And somebody said, oh, this is going to be fun. And I just heard that. And I went, oh, no, we're not. We, this, this will not be fun. And so it, it, and, and so it was it, it, and, and I just I just heard that. And it was like the universe told me it was like the universe was telling me watch this very specifically because you had just warned what something could turn into. And it was, and you know, and then when they, when the first time they did it, you know, the singer started to perform, you know, and started doing that. And I went, it's a recording session. There is no audience. So it's about the words. It's about the language, the guys, you know, you are saying words, you, you know, my jelly, my jelly roll. You, you're just saying the word you don't know what the black culture, what the slang for jelly roll more, for jelly roll is. You don't know that. You're just going, my jelly roll. You're, you could just be shouting, give me ham and eggs. You don't, you just don't, don't imbue it with anything. It's an alien language. It's an alien song to you. So that kind of like almost monotone quality of it took it away from the realm of being fun and made it culturally specific and both haunting and unsettling at that point in the film. Mm. And I may not have been as alert or as sensitive to the delineation of those choices had somebody not said, oh, this is gonna be fun. Right, yeah, so we, yeah, gotta keep your ears open. Absolutely. Trust that the, that the process is gonna speak back to you. 
It's amazing. I mean, I have to say, just just the sheer ambition um, uh, of what you've created over your career and in scope, you know, whether it's Angels and Seven Hours or Shuffle Along, the whole six black experience. It's absolutely inspiring. And, um, you know, I know this Sunday, both Viola Davis and Chadwick Boseman are, are nominated and, you know, they definitely deserve those awards. And absolutely. I want to thank you so much for taking this time and having this conversation. All right, great. No, this is absolutely fun. Thank you very much. Thank, thank you. you.